Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, the title of the message this evening is called Salvation Present. And I'm going to be pulling from two verses, as you can see there, First Chronicles 4.18 and the well-known John 3.16. Uh, but we're going to be on a little roller coaster ride today because those verses need context. And so um, I'll be providing that context for you. Each one of those verses, we have to look at a few different places to be able to really understand those, those verses. And even the title needs a little explanation because it's got a triple meaning to it. Salvation present, three, three different meanings with those two words here. And fortunately, we're just going to focus on one of the three meanings, all right? So salvation present, salvation is a present, all right? It's a gift. It's, it's a gift that's given, not earned. Salvation is a present. The second one is that salvation is present. It is available now. You don't have to wait and think about it. It's available right now. And um, then the third one that we're going to focus on mainly is salvation is an ongoing process of God working in the life of a believer. So salvation is always now. Salvation is it's not some single moment that happened and done with. It is always now. Once you accept that, it's always, it's always present. And so we're going to devote this evening to that third meaning by focusing on these two verses here, 1 Chronicles 4.18 and John 3.16. And we're not going to dwell on any superficial questions such as, will I always be saved regardless of my behavior, or can I backslide and lose my salvation? Instead, if we could go to this next slide, i got a little image here for you. <laughs> Instead, we're going to start out by emphasizing that God created salvation not as some loophole enabling us to continue in our sin, nor as some unbearable yoke keeping us enslaved by our sin. He created salvation so that we could perceive we're spiritually dead before him, right? And he created salvation so now we're spiritually alive. Alive means that we can perceive and respond to his guidance and choose to draw near to him. That's why he created salvation. And so bearing this in mind, let's turn now to 1 Chronicles 4.18. If you need a little bit of time to get to that, um, you know, no, no problem. I, I have a little harder time finding it myself because I'm used to reading it in Hebrew. And, and it's in a different place. It's in with the writings if you go to the Jewish scriptures. And, and so, so it's, 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 then it is in the King James. So if you need a minute there, go for it. It's First Chronicles, not the second one. And I got it up here as well. Um, but, um, and that's with the Hebrew and, and the English there as well. So we're going to start off with that one and, um, and see what God has to teach us from this verse here. So I'm going to read it to you here, and, and pardon my pronunciation over some of these names. I don't really know how to pronounce them. They don't have the original, they don't have vowels. And so, uh, and his wife Jehudijah bore Jared, father of Gador, and Haber, father of Soko, and Jekuthiel, father of Zanoah. And these are the sons of Bithia, the daughter of Pharaoh, which Merid took. Unlike John 3.16, this verse is probably unfamiliar to most of us. Is that fair to say? probably unfamiliar, never, never heard it. If you've read the Bible all the way through multiple times, maybe you still don't remember that you ever read this. Is that probably fair to say? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so we tend to, myself included, to skim over or even skip over these long lists of names that you find in the genealogies and so forth. And so what, what is this verse about? And, and how does it teach us anything about salvation? So I think we need to get a little more context, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you with that. The first nine chapters of First Chronicles consists of genealogies. It's names after names after names, and it's not like Fred and Ralph. It's names that we can't even pronounce, okay? And so chapter four is where this is. It presents a genealogy of the tribe of Judah, and it's quite difficult to follow, not just for me, but for anybody, mostly because the relationship between the individuals is unclear. Sometimes you can't really tell, is that a proper noun? Is that a name of some person? Or is it a description of somebody? You can't tell sometimes. And then the relationships is, is difficult to follow at, at places. So 
Chapter 4 is the most difficult of 1 of Chronicles. Verse 18 is the most difficult of chapter 4. Okay, it's the most difficult verse, it, but it includes a name that's so important yet so easy to miss, and that is Bithia, daughter of Pharaoh. If you're reading this, you, maybe if you take a little pause and slow down through all those names, maybe it would catch your attention, and maybe you would ask the question, what is a daughter of an Egyptian pharaoh doing in a genealogy of the tribe of Judah. Who is this woman, and how might God be using this woman in recorded scripture to teach us an important lesson about salvation? Bithia's name occurs nowhere else in scripture. But if we read the whole verse in context, we can tell that his wife Jehudija and Bithia, that's the same person. You can tell if you read the verse in context there. In Hebrew, the word Jehudija means Jewish or Jewish woman. And if you have the King James with some notes, you might, it might say Jehudija in the, in the verse, but in the notes it might say or Jewish. So it's either meaning that's somebody's name, Jehudija, or it means the Jewish or the Jewish woman. Okay, And so we, the King James authors didn't, the, the writers, the translators, they didn't know, so they put both. Okay, So it means Jewish or Jewish woman. So here's what this verse is saying here. It's saying that some man named Merid got married to a Jewish woman named Bithia who was a daughter of Pharaoh. That's what it's saying. Okay, The expression daughter of Pharaoh occurs only three other times throughout the Bible. Two of the references are to a woman who turned Solomon's heart away from God, so that's clearly not the right woman, that Bithia is not that woman. The chronology and the circumstances are all wrong. The only other daughter of Pharaoh mentioned in the Bible is the woman in Exodus 2, who drew the three-month-old baby Moses from the Nile. So, fair question, could Bithia here in 1 Chronicles 4.18, be the same daughter of Pharaoh who saved Moses? Could she be? Well, the Bible does not explicitly state that these are one and the same person, but the Bible does cite sources that do give detailed accounts of Bithia as the daughter of Pharaoh who saved Moses in Exodus 2. So if you want to turn here, you can, but it's not necessary. In Joshua 10.13, maybe write it down and come back to it when you have time. Joshua 10.13 and 2 Samuel 1.18. In those two passages, God's word directs us to an ancient history book called the Book of Jasher. And even in the New Testament, in 2 Timothy 3.8, Paul cites this book of Jasher, chapter 79, verse 27, when mentioning these two enigmatic characters named Janus and Jambers, he doesn't say who they are, but the book of Jasher does say who they are. Paul assumes that you would already know who they are. He doesn't tell you who they are because they're already mentioned in this book of Jasher that he's citing. Now these people were two of Pharaoh's magicians who opposed Moses during the, the time when he's trying to get Pharaoh to free the people. So both Exodus and Jasher chapter 68 tell us that Moses was three months old when he was put into this ark of bulrushes and placed in the river. Both of the, the Exodus and Jasher say that. But Jasher chapter 68 gives us a bit more detail saying that during this time, God sent forth a terrible oppressive heat in the land of Egypt. And Jasher 68, 17 says that Bithia, daughter of Pharaoh, went with her maidens to bathe in the river to get some relief from this consuming heat. There, she lifted her eyes up to the river, saw the ark, and then sent one of the maids to go fetch it. And I got a little picture here. It's not it's just maybe one of the a depiction of, of one of the handmaids that, that Bithia sent. Um, like Exodus 2, 6, Jasher 68, 19 says that when she opened this ark, she saw the child. And he wept, and she had compassion on him. And doesn't say this, but you can kind of read between the lines. She recognized that he was circumcised, right? She opens the basket. She sees it's circumcised. And that's when she says in, in Exodus, oh, this is one of the Hebrew children, 
right? Because she could tell that he'd been circumcised. All right, they got to be circumcised when they're eight days old. He's three months old, so we know he's been circumcised. Uh, from there, we know that uh, she paid Moses' uh, biological mother, Jochebed, to nurse him until he was two years old. And after that, Bithia raised him in Pharaoh's house, and he became her son, and she named him Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. And that's in Exodus chapter 2, verse 10. And by the way, in ancient Egyptian, the name Moses also means son. It means in Hebrew, I drew him out of the water. Even though she didn't, she got somebody to do it for her. <laughs> but then, then in Egypt, Egyptian, son means son. So if Bithia, the daughter of Pharaoh in 1 Chronicles 4.18 is the same person described in Exodus 2, then let's come back to what we're here for. <laughs> what might God be teaching us about salvation in these two complementary passages? And you can see from that slide, not just Exodus, but Jasher, and then there's even um, commentaries. The Bible actually cites commentaries, which we, in, in English, they're translated as stories, but in Hebrew, the word is midrash. And so there are midrashim, that, that also talk about Bithia. So they, they all back it up, that, that Bithia is the daughter of Pharaoh. So again, what, what might God be trying to teach us about salvation in, the, in Exodus 2 and 1 Chronicles 4.18? And so for just a few moments this evening, I'd like to show you that Bithia's life teaches us three important details about salvation, specifically God's actions and our individual responses to him. And I'll show them to you all three at one time here on this next slide. So this is really important, don't miss this part. Without ever taking away anybody's choices, God initiates salvation. God sent forth the consuming heat wave that drove Bithia and her maidservants to the river. God allowed the circumstances to unfold that compelled Moses' mother, Jochebed, to place her baby in a basket in the Nile. God creates salvation, but again, he never takes away anybody's choices. There's no robots here. Each one of us chooses how to respond to God. And by the way, indecision is a choice. That's a choice. Uh, everyone not only will make a choice, but everyone is making a choice right now. For Bithia, what began as an attempt to find some kind of relief in response to the oppressive heat wave, well, it became a response to a mild curiosity of seeing a basket floating in the river. And her eventual response was compassion over a helpless Hebrew baby. And this was followed by her decision to care for the baby, even at risk of her own, her own life. So the second thing that you see here is that God saves us based on who he is, not on who we are. And I'm hoping that most of us here tonight know about this. This is just to reinforce, just to remind us about that and then our responses to it. So God entrusted Moses' care to Bithia, not because of her merit or, oh, she's got prestige, she's the daughter of a pharaoh, oh, she's such a good person. None of those reasons. And Bithia didn't go down to the Nile looking to adopt a baby. And she didn't um, wait until she felt the timing was right. Let me think about that and get back to you. She didn't do any of that. She didn't wait until she, let me get a better read on this situation here. There's this baby in the river. Let, let, me, let me fill that out and find the timing and, until I have a piece about it. Let me, let me wait until then. Let me deliberate and analyze it to death. She didn't do any of that. She didn't wait for any insights from logic or science or technology. And, it doesn't say that she relied on any feedback from friends or family either. She didn't go to Bible college. Not that there's anything wrong with that. She didn't pursue a degree in rabbinic studies. She didn't study Jewish culture and faith before she made a decision about caring for that baby. She didn't even fetch the baby out of the water herself. Okay, it says in the Bible, she had one of her maid servants go get the baby out. There's a basket. She didn't know there was a baby in there, right? Her decision to care for baby Moses was no more based on human logic than God's decision to entrust her with the baby in the first place. All Bithia had to offer was compassion for a helpless baby and a refusal to go along with her father's decree to kill the child. Because the father said, kill all the Hebrew kids, 
all the new, newborn uh, boys. Um, she hadn't come to any point of turning to God. Um, she trusted in her compassion for that helpless baby. That's what motivated her to get the baby out of the, out of the river and to take care of the baby. That, that is what she put her trust in. But that trust that she did have in her own self and her compassion, that did lead to a trust in God. And notice the irony here. This is so wonderful. I don't know if you've noticed this or not in God's word here. In Exodus 1, 22, Pharaoh commands all the people to throw every newborn, Hebrew newborn son into the river. Moses' biological mother obeyed Pharaoh's decree because she put the baby into the river. She did what the Pharaoh said. The biological mother did what the Pharaoh said. But the Pharaoh's own daughter did the exact opposite. She pulled the baby out of the river. I think God's got a little sense of humor there. But that's what really, really happened. So, <laughs> so the third thing on this list here, third action, is that God accepts us as we are, but he does not leave us as we are. And I've heard so many people that they say, I, I, I'm not ready to, to make a commitment because I can't picture myself living the way that I know I should. And I'm not going to give up this. I'm not going to give up that. They're making the decision based on themselves, not on, on God. He accepts you right where you are. It doesn't matter whether you think that you can improve yourself or whether you can't. And none of that happens because he goes to work. He does the work. You don't have to do anything. And we have these, these addictions and these tendencies and proclivities that, that make us feel like it's impossible. How can I make my heart love God when my heart doesn't love God. I can't control that. So I'm not going to get saved. I'm not going to make that commitment. You know? And that is trying to rob God of the work that he's trying to do. Okay? Let him do the work. He'll do it. You can't do it anyway. That's why he sent Jesus to die on a cross. So um, anyway, the, the third is, is yeah, that we, he, he won't leave us where we are. And back to Bithia. She was a Pharaoh's daughter. She was raised to worship multiple gods, including her father, right? The father was a mediator. The Pharaoh was a mediator between thousands of gods and, and the people, right? So he was worshiped as well. She was raised with an Egyptian worldview that's fundamentally shaped and governed by belief in countless gods. And by the way, countless gods, it's shaped by a belief in countless gods other than the God of Abraham. Sure, they might have known about the God of Abraham, but the God of Abraham, the one that we worship here, that was the God of the Hebrew slaves. They're not going to make their life choices based on the God of Abraham. So that's, that's how Bithy was raised. She knew little to nothing of God or his people. All she had, again, all she had at first was a compassion for a helpless baby and a firm resolution not to let him die. God worked with that. And her heart for the Hebrew baby grew to a heart for the Hebrew people. She paid Jochebed to nurse that baby for two years. And then, then Bithia named him Moses and raised him in Pharaoh's palace as her own son. And Okay, don't miss this. She didn't keep him isolated in Pharaoh's palace, thoroughly indoctrinating him in the Egyptian worldview. Why is that? How do I know that? Take a look at Exodus 2.11. It says here, when Moses was grown up, he went out to his brethren. She instilled in him, those Hebrew people, that's your brethren. Pharaoh didn't. Right? The Pharaoh wouldn't have done that, right? She did that. And so this is the part that's kind of bad, is that witnessing their labors moved Moses to compassion, and unfortunately it even stirred him to strike down an Egyptian who was beating on one of, the, on one of his brethren. He identified these Hebrew people out there working in the, the, the hard labor as his people. Where did he get that if he's raised in the, in the Pharaoh's palace? He got that from Bithia, from his mother, from the mother who raised him. Well, we don't hear any more about Bithia from this time period, but in 1 Chronicles 4.18, we read that her compassion for a Hebrew baby had grown even deeper from a heart for God's people to a heart for God himself. How do I know that? Well, this, this verse tells us 
that Bithia converted to Judaism. She's the Jewess. She's the Jewish woman. She became Jewish, and she married a Jewish man named Merid. And so we can see some information here about uh, what the Hebrew looks like and these names that we find while we're reading it. So in Exodus 2, this daughter of Pharaoh is not named. In the original Hebrew, you can see she's referred only to as Bat Paro, which means daughter of Pharaoh. And again, I can't tell if it's Bit Paro or Bat Paro because there's no vowels originally, all right? So Bat Paro, Bit Paro, um, daughter of Pharaoh. But in 1 Chronicles 4.18, she's named Jehudijah or the Jewess. And then at the end of the verse, she is named specifically. Now it's a proper noun. It's not just a description um, daughter of Pharaoh. No, this is her name now is Batya or Bitya, which means daughter of God. That's her name now. Okay. She went from being a daughter of Pharaoh to being a daughter of the Jews, Jewish, to being a daughter of God. She went from desiring relief from this heat to, to desiring God to work in her heart and in her mind for his purpose. She went from having a heart for God's people to becoming one of God's people and the daughter of God, the daughter of God who saved, named. Moses had other names, right? You think he's three months old and he don't have a name? She named him Moses. His mother, had, uh, his mother gave him a name, I promise you, before that. When you get circumcised, you got to tell the rabbi what's the name of the baby. When he was eight days old, she gave that rabbi some kind of name, the priest, some kind of name, right? We don't know what it is. We don't know him recorded by that. We know him by the name that Bithia gave him as Moses. And, and so here we have, she saved, named, raised, one of the most important figures in all of God's word, one of the two men who appeared in glory during the transfiguration communicating with Jesus about his death and resurrection. That's Moses. Moses, and she raised him. This Bithia person. So to reinforce the picture of salvation that Bithia's life offers us, I'd like now to devote the remainder of our time this evening to the most popular Bible verse in the whole world, I would say, a Bible verse that is searched well over two million times a month, and that is John 3.16. But before we turn there, all right, if we could go to the next slide here. <laughs> I'd like to ask you three questions. So he's got his eyes closed, so don't turn there yet. <laughs> he's got his eyes covered. So um, I want to ask three questions. And I've asked a lot of people these questions, and... Nobody can, nobody, going to church their whole lives, nobody's been able to answer all three of these questions here without looking at the Bible, okay? So, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, the three questions. Almost most of us here probably have this verse even memorized, I would imagine, right? Uh, but I suspect that very, very few of us really know the verse as well as we think we do. So the first question that hopefully most of us can answer, and I'm going to open it up here if you don't mind. If, and, um, yeah, who, who spoke John 3.16 in the Bible? Does anybody want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, Jesus. Good. Okay, good. That, that one is pretty, pretty straightforward. Everybody I asked got that one nailed down right. The second question is, to whom did Jesus say these words? Yeah, Nicodemus, I've heard people say the disciples, I've heard, I don't know, right? But yeah, Nicodemus, okay, so uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll fill in the rest here, the third question nobody's gotten before, uh, and also it takes a little more description anyway, so um, yeah, the harder, most important question I would say is what's the context of the verse? If you got the verse memorized, what's the first word of John 3.16? Four. So, you know, we, we hear all the time in here, what's the therefore? What's the therefore, right? What's the, what's the therefore therefore, right? So for is a conjunction. It's Jesus is telling Nicodemus something, and then this is an explanation of what he had just said. So the context is critical here. And, and so that's what I want to get into here for, for a moment. And so we really need to... Um, 
understand what Jesus is connecting to John 3.16. And we need to get his words in context, uh, context so that we don't miss what he's trying to teach us here. So I'm going to back up. You don't have to, but I'm going to back up to chapter 2 of, Ch of John. We, we read there that Jesus began performing miracles by changing water into wine at the wedding of Cana. And then around the time of Passover, he went to Jerusalem where he drove the money changers from the temple. And the Jews asked for a sign of his authority, and he answered by saying, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. Okay? And of course they mocked him. But already here, at the very beginning of his ministry, actually before he planned for his ministry, remember because Mary said, could you, do, could you do something about this wedding situation here? He wasn't ready to do that yet. That wasn't, that's not what he had in his mind, but he honored his mother's request and he did that. So at the very beginning of his ministry, here he is overturning the money changers and already talking about his death and resurrection. He's already talking about laying down his life and rising from the dead on the third day. Now, while in Jerusalem at the Passover, he performed many miracles. And even though people supposedly believed in him, Jesus could see into their hearts. He knew who was genuine and who was superficial. And unfortunately, it seemed like a lot of them were superficial. They were there for the miracles and the wow and the razzle-dazzle. That's what they were there for. And he had reserve in his dealings with people who professed to have faith in him. Because he could see through that. The words is one thing, but I can see right into your heart. I can tell. And so it's in these circumstances that Nicodemus comes onto the scene in John chapter 3. And I got a little depiction of Nicodemus here as well. So on this next slide. Probably isn't what he looked like, but maybe, maybe similar. So uh, he was a ruler of the Jews, John chapter 3 tells us. He was a Pharisee, so he was highly educated in the Torah. And you know, we hear the word Pharisee all the time, but I took, the moment to, took a moment to search out the meaning of the, of the name Pharisee. It actually comes from the Hebrew word parash, which means to spread out, okay? And so I, I know, we all know the Pharisees, or we think of them as cold and legalistic, and yeah, they became that way. And Jesus, Jesus had a lot of words to say about the Pharisees, but... But they started out <laughs> with a desire to spread out, or in other words, lay out God's word so that it could be easily and plainly understood for everyday life. And don't we say that? We, we go through a Bible passage, and then how does it apply for Monday morning? That's what the Pharisees were all about. That's, what they want. That's how they started, at least. And then they went off into left field and became cold and, and heartless and legalistic and, and that kind of thing. So their goal was originally to understand God's word and lay it out. Let me lay it out for you, people, so you can understand how it relates to you and applies to you in your everyday life. You don't have to be some priest to understand the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. That's the Pharisees that, that are saying that at first. So what we have with Nicodemus, he's a Pharisee. He's got his imperfect faith, but he has a genuine desire to understand. But he comes to Jesus at nighttime. <laughs> okay, it says that. It's important to notice what, what is said there. He had sincere questions about salvation, but he was ashamed and afraid of asking Jesus his questions in public. Nicodemus begins by telling Jesus, we know you are a teacher from God. And you don't want to miss that. He's presuming to speak on behalf of the other Pharisees, and his confession to Jesus is superficial. All right? And although he had just encountered superficial people just a few moments ago who cared only about his miracles, Jesus met with Nicodemus anyway. And probably, I can imagine, left the light on for him. He knew he was coming, right? He knew, he knew full well that Nicodemus was going to be dropping by and, and made a point to leave the light on. And so Jesus started by, if you look at John chapter 3, he started by listening. But before Nicodemus could ask his question, here's those three things, God's actions again. Jesus initiated. Number two, he initiated, well, because of who Jesus is, Jesus welcomed Nicodemus. He knew Nicodemus was, had imperfect faith, superficial, 
uh, speaking lies, coming at nighttime under cover of dark. He knew all that, and he welcomed him with all of his imperfections because of who Jesus was, not because of who Nicodemus was. And then Jesus accepted Nicodemus as he was, but he didn't leave him as he was. That's the third thing, and we keep coming back to those three actions that God takes and then our responses to those. Jesus helped Nicodemus to understand man's greatest need, that is, pardon from sin and peace with God. We need to be reconciled with God. That is the only thing that we need, is reconciliation with God. We think we need a lot more than that, but, but really, that's, that's all we really need. So this is when Jesus told Nicodemus, and I'm just going to paraphrase here. You're not going to find these exact words in John chapter 3. He's basically saying, you got it all wrong. I'm not sent from God to teach and work miracles. I'm sent by God to sacrifice my life in atonement for man's sin. And for your sin, Nicodemus, that's why I'm sent by God. Not to wow people with miracles, not to... Not to raise somebody from the dead and they're just going to die again anyway. That's not why I came here. And after explaining man's need to be born again, as you can read there, Jesus helped Nicodemus to understand salvation by making an astonishing yet absolutely perfect comparison. And he says this, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then the question is this, well, why does Jesus have to be lifted up so people believe in him won't perish? Well, the answer is because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 is the reason for what he's saying before that. So we need to know the statement and the question that goes with it. And this is the answer to all that, John 3.16. So Moses holding up the fiery serpent is the context for John 3.16. And to understand that verse... To understand what it really means to believe in him, I remember when I was a kid going to Sunday school, hearing this verse, and not really knowing what it means to believe in him. I believe the electricity is working in here. I believe there's train tracks behind here. I believe I'm in Springfield, Oregon. I believe in gravity. I believe that there's, the moon is out there somewhere. I believe that, but is that what it means in John 3.16, to believe in him? To understand the powerful truth that Jesus reveals about salvation here, what it means to believe in him, we need to take a closer look at Numbers 21, which, by the way, would have been intimately familiar to Nicodemus, right, as a Pharisee. He would have had it memorized. He would have had the whole five books of the, of the Torah completely memorized, okay? So he would have certainly known this, ch ch chapter 21 of Numbers. Here's a quick summary, so we don't have to go through all that. Moses had been leading the Israelites through the wilderness, and God helped them. And they were glad, but they'd go right back to grumbling and speaking out against God and Moses. And this cycle went on and on and on and on. And at the beginning of Numbers 21, God had just delivered Israel from the Canaanites. And after giving them a crushing victory over their oppressors, well, they're on their way to the land of Edom now, which is east of uh, where Israel is. And, and so the route that they had to take was, was difficult. Okay? And so there's mountains and terrain. And so it was difficult and, and a long way to go. And so here they are again, grumbling and speaking out against God and Moses and being thoroughly disrespectful, just to be honest. So God sent fiery serpents among the people. They were bitten People were bitten and many of the people died. And as usual, they cried out to Moses, admitting that they had sinned, and asked him, will you please pray to, that God would take away these serpents? God responded, as you could read in Numbers chapter 21, not by taking away the serpents, but by instructing Moses to make a fiery serpent. Instead of getting rid of them, he says, make one. And put it up on this pole. And uh, those who look at the fiery serpent lifted up on the pole, it's not a real serpent, it's a fake one, made out of bronze probably. Well, if you look at that, you're not going to die 
after you get bitten. You're still going to be bit by these poisonous snakes. But if you look at that serpent that's on the pole, you're not going to die. Now, as we noticed in the life of Bithia, we see again three actions that God takes when saving us. He initiated and created a way for those people to be saved. And he did so because of who he is, absolutely, certainly not because they deserved it. These were horrible, grumbling all the time. God helps them. They firsthand witness God helping them, and then they go to complaining again. Okay? They certainly did not deserve it. And, and we'll see in a moment that God didn't leave the people as they were. So, but Numbers 21 also gives us a very vivid picture of how God expects us to respond to him. And this is what I want you to picture. Every time I've read Numbers 21, I've had kind of a very limited picture. Okay, very limited, just to be honest. And as I was preparing this, my, my picture broadened a bit. Okay, so this is what I want you to picture. This is what I did. Imagine this. You are one person among two million men, women, children, along with their livestock, provisions, belongings. There's poisonous serpents all around biting and killing people. They're biting you. There's utter pandemonium as people all around you are screaming, running for their lives, collapsing and dying as they are bitten. And rather than looking at your feet, trying to protect yourself from, against these serpents, you must look at a brazen serpent lifted up on a pole. In a crowd of two million people, you might not even be able to see the serpent on the pole. So perhaps while you're being bitten, you'd have to make your way toward it somehow so you would even be able to look at it. You have a very real choice to make here. You either trust in human logic and look down at the ground to snakes, try to fend them off as best you can, or you trust in God's promise, which, by the way, does not conform to human logic. It doesn't make a lick of sense. I'm going to look at some snake way over there. I'm going to make my way to it if I have to and not look down at these snakes. I'm going to look where, the, where I think the direction that this snake up on a pole is because I can't even see it. That does not fit human logic. There's no spectators in this situation here. There's nobody on the sidelines watching this. You're in it. And you don't have time to ask foolish questions such as, how long do I need to look at the serpent lifted up on the pole? Or is it really the only way that I can be saved to look at this? You don't have time for those kind of questions. You don't have time to stand around trying to make up your mind whether to trust God's promise. You can, but there's snakes all around. And if you're not looking at the pole and they bite you, you're dead. That's it. So you don't have time to deliberate and to analyze the situation. So back to the three actions God takes here. I'll put that slide up again. Salvation present. Salvation is a gift from God presented to you right now. And right now, you already are making one of two choices. You either look at the fiery serpent on the pole or don't. There's, there's nothing in between. There's no half-heartedness possible here, even if you want it to be. In his absolute sovereignty here, God used the problem to create the solution for saving his people. The fiery serpent lifted up on the pole was the means of saving the people from the serpents that were biting and killing the people. God used a serpent to save the people from the serpents that were killing the people. Nicodemus was intimately familiar with this incident, and he had a very clear understanding of the response that God expected from his people. Nicodemus also knew that God didn't leave his people where they were, God honored his promise to save those people who trusted in him, and their trust in him deepened. Nicodemus knew that immediately after this incident with the snakes all over the ground, that the survivors were singing to God. And God gave them clear guidance as they went on to defeat King Sihon and King Og and take possession of the lands of the Amorites. That's what God did for, for the people. They put their trust in his direction. 
Nicodemus must have clearly understood the comparison between Jesus and the fiery serpent because he doesn't ask any more questions here. And the next time we hear from him, he's openly in broad daylight speaking up to his fellow Pharisees in defense of Jesus. And the third and last time we hear from Nicodemus is when he brought a 75-pound, who knows how expensive it was, mixture of myrrh and aloes for Jesus' body after he was crucified. Jesus accepted Nicodemus where he was, but certainly didn't leave him where he was. Nicodemus understood that just as Moses lifted up the fiery serpent on a pole, God lifted up Jesus Christ on a cross. Just as the fiery serpent on the pole saved the people from the serpents killing the people, Jesus on the cross became the curse of the law to redeem us from the curse of the law. You can read that in Galatians chapter 3.13. Just as the people were being bitten by serpents all around, well, we are being bitten by sin and evil, unfortunately, not just around us, but within us. And each of us will be bitten by death. God didn't get rid of those serpents, and he doesn't get rid of our sin nature or stop our physical death, but he creates a way to save us from spiritual death. And God expects us to respond not with superficial faith, or indecisiveness, but with wholehearted trust and obedience in him. And the survivors, they had to look intently on the serpent on the pole. Each one of us must look upon Christ just as intently. The survivors relied only on God's promise. We must rely only on God's promise by keeping our gaze fixed on Jesus and what he accomplished for us. By his death on the cross. Believing in him, what does it mean to believe in him then? It's assertive, it's intentional, and there's a sense of urgency about it. When we think of John 3.16, we tend to focus on its comforting words about God's love and the gift of everlasting life. And that, that's true, it's good. But we must also remember the sacrifice and the extreme cost of that gift. And if we go to this next slide over here, I, I have a uh, picture here that I have for you. Just as the fiery serpent was lifted up on a pole to save the believers who looked upon it, Jesus was lifted up on a cross to save believers who look upon him. Why? Because God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever would believe in him put their trust in his merit, what he accomplished for us through his death and resurrection. Whoever believes in him the way those people believed and looking at that serpent on that pole, that's the believing. That's what he means by believing. Whoever does that would have everlasting life in fellowship with God. He doesn't just save us to keep us out of hell. He saves us for himself so we can be with him and we should want that. So as we wrap up, the main takeaway from our time together this evening is that God initiates salvation and presents it to each of us right now because of who he is not because of who we are and he accepts each of us just as we are but he'll never leave us as we are and you don't want to miss this this might be a little shocking there's no invitation to respond to God the invitation that we have every Sunday is not to respond to God or his word there's no need for such an invitation because each of one of us already is responding to God and his word. Everybody is already responding. Whether you ever set foot in a church or not, you're responding to God and his word. You're invited. There is an invitation, but not to respond. The invitation is to consider how you are responding now and to respond to him differently going forward, no matter what your background is, whether you've made a commitment to Christ or whether you've been uh, on the fence about it, no matter where we are, it's how am I responding to God now and how am I just gonna respond differently going forward? So the challenge for each of us this evening, the last slide here, is about how we are responding to God and how we should respond differently going forward. Today's a turning point. This challenge is simple. Accept, live, share salvation present. 
If you have not accepted the gift of salvation, know that God has created salvation and is freely offering it to you right now based on his merit, not yours. God accepts you as you are. He'll never leave you as you are because he seeks your highest good. And if you have already accepted his gift of salvation, how intently are you looking upon Christ lifted up? How is it going with the distractions of all those poisonous serpents around? How's that going? Are you all in for Jesus Christ? Do you only look into him and not looking down at the poisonous serpents? Do you rely only on him? Do you look upon him with assertiveness, intentionality, and urgency as the believers did with the fiery serpent lifted up on the pole? And if we genuinely treasure, if we recognize God's salvation for what it is, the priceless treasure, the greatest gift ever given, if we really recognize that, then we must respond by contending for the faith, as Jude 3 says, and letting others know of salvation present, not only by our words, but also by our actions, all of which are the fruit God produces in our heart. All right? So I'm going to close this out with a word of prayer, and you guys can be dismissed. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for drawing us here this evening. Thank you for the hymn, I Am Resolved, No Longer to Linger. Thank you for your word, for teaching us about how you save us. We, we probably already knew these three actions, but maybe we need to think more about the response and maybe not be so passive as, as, as we respond to you. We need to be assertive, intentional, not to earn your merit, but out of gratitude and reverence to you for what you've done and really trust your promise, realizing how that we, we need to put our trust in you. There's no other option. We're thankful that there is an option. And I pray that, that people will go away this evening well, having learned something from your word that will help help each one of us to leave here differently, respond to you differently than how we came in. That's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.